specialist, and I'm also a principal reviewer for the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And the role I'm playing today is a reviewer of science, just like I'm a reviewer of medicine submitted to the journal that I'm a principal reviewer. Okay, uh, my name is, uh, my pen name is uh, Dr. Truman Arden Smith. I wrote a booklet that's on uh, Amazon.com. Uh, and in this program guide here, you can see uh, the booklet I wrote and also the one that Barb wrote. It tells you a little bit about this. I'm a former evangelical Christian, and I, and I left uh, Christianity. A big reason for that is uh, probably to do with evolution. Okay. So, should I start my presentation now? Um, well, let's see. I just want to take a little bit of time. So you have 15 minutes Sorry, presentation. All right, to do your... Okay. Ready? Take a look. Okay. Let me help start my. Okay. Uh, first slide. Got it. Okay. I have uh, two parts to my presentation. The first part is a general overview of science, and the second one is some DNA or some evidence for evolution. Next slide. Uh, go the other way. There we go. Uh, I wanted to recommend this book here. This is a book about critical thinking. And uh, so this is some philosophy coming in here. Basically, what this book, and th th you can buy this at half.com, this older edition for $5, including postage. So it's, um, I would definitely recommend this for your library. It's written by a couple of philosophy professors. They use this at, at Portland State University in their critical thinking course. It'll teach you how you can gain knowledge and, for example, why dreams and visions and prophets and things like that are not a good source for knowledge. They may be a good source for creating a hypothesis, but that hypothesis has to be tested. And also, uh, there's logical reasoning, and sometimes that goes astray when you use logical fallacies. And so, this will teach you about some of the basic logical fallacies. And, uh, next page. So, what is a hypothesis? Well. We find ourselves in the world where we have all these facts. For example, we have um, fossils, we have DNA code, and our goal is to try to piece this all together. How can we make sense of this? So basically, you can say a uh, hypothesis is the inference to the best explanation. And so we want to. So now, now our goal is we have all these different hypotheses about how the world came to be. How did humans come to be? How did the universe come to be? How did the Earth come to be? How, how can we test these? Well, like this book I'm recommending, it has uh, suggested five criteria. One is testability. Can your hypothesis be tested? For example, if you say, well, God did it by a miracle, you can't really test that if it's a one-time event. But if you said, well, things evolve, there's all kinds of tests you can think up. You can think up, and there's a lot of scientific literature on this. Um, so testability, if you can't test it, then you can't really find out if it's true or not. I mean, if you can get some validating evidence, that can give you some more confidence that it might be true. And if you get something that disconfirms it, then you can say, okay, well, at least now I could, uh, now I know it's not right, now I can maybe revise my hypothesis and, and get closer to the truth. So that's why testability is really important. Fruitfulness is can your hypothesis predict things? Uh, for example, in evolution, they'll say, well, according, if evolution is correct, we might expect to see this certain fossil in this certain area then people have gone digging for those exact fossils and they have found them. But if you say, for example, well, I think God just created things by a miracle, well, what can you predict? Well, I don't know if you can really predict anything from that. So that makes that, that hypothesis very difficult to be called science. Also, scope. When you find a bone, you say, well, I have a perfect explanation for that one bone, but it doesn't really relate to a lot of other things. But if you're... Um, but if it has a wide scope, for example, you might say, well, according to evolutionary theory, we found this boat, this, this bone in this certain layer of dirt, and we expect to find similar uh, organisms across the entire world. And so it, it reaches, uh, has a bigger scope that way. It explains more than just one little artifact. Simplicity is using what they call Occam's razor, where you, you're trying to see the hypothesis is trying to solve a mystery and you don't want to add more mysteries in your explanation. So, for example, if you say, well, God did a miracle and that's how everything came to be, well, that's not much of an answer because now instead of answering the question, now you're bringing up more questions. Well, what is this God? Who is this God? And all this stuff. So if you have a naturalistic explanation, it's a lot more simpler and easier to test. Um, and conservatism is, when you have a hypothesis, 
does this like totally overturn everything we already know, or is this like already in line with what we know in other fields, for example, uh, physics and chemistry and all that? So does it greatly contradict our background knowledge, or is it conducive with it? Next slide. Uh, I wanted to warn you about some creationist tactics that I've seen used. One is to say, like, well, evolution is not true. Let me point out one little thing. And if you say, well, here's the answer for that. Well, here's another thing. Well, here's the answer for that. Well, here's another thing. Well, I've never heard that one before. Well, yeah, you should go look into it because that's evidence against evolution. So basically, it's taking these pot shots. And what I want to say is it's the wrong way to go at it. What you need to do if you want to be really honest about this and use a scientific method is create a better hypothesis and say, my hypothesis is better than yours. So as long as you're just taking pot shots, you're not really having a good view at this. You're just trying to shoot something down with bad motives. Um, and so, for example, I, I know Bart is partial to young earth creationism. It's called creation science, where they think maybe 4,000 years ago there was a worldwide flood. The whole universe and everything was created about, you know, who knows, around 7,000 years ago or so. Now, I was saying in science, it's, it's pretty bad if a scientist is off by 2x, but this conflicts with modern science by 2x times 1 million. So the universe has not been around 7,000 years. You multiply that by 1,000 and you get 7 million. Multiply it by another 1,000 you get 7, you know, uh, 7 billion and double it, 14. So this is a huge difference. And this is, I, I hope Bart's going to give up alternate hypothesis instead of just try to shoot holes because if you see his alternate hypothesis, I think you would say, well, obviously evolution makes better sense than this. That conflicts with everything we know. Next slide. Also, there's kind of a battle of world views here because um, a lot of creationists, you know, they have this, this old mentality where, you know, they're very special and the world revolves around them, kind of an idea. Whereas with evolution, you really learn how insignificant you are, and you have to deal with that. There's kind of maybe some emotional things involved with that. <laughs> um, so, for example, in the scientific view, and I'm saying scientific, not atheist, because there's a lot of Christians and scientists who also go for this 100%. It's all about evolution. It starts with cosmological evolution, which explains how everything came from energy. We got matter. At the time of the Big Bang, there was, not, there was no matter whatsoever. Um, then... Um, stars were formed and there's a thing called nucleosynthesis where other chemicals are, are made. Uh, so from this cosmological evolution we get biological evolution where we get life coming from non-life. And then I add on there mimetic evolution which is the ideas of thoughts and this is going to high technology. Um, so basically cosmological evolution, the biological evolution, the mimetic evolution. I'm looking at the past and the present and then the future here. In the past we have uh, cosmological, like I said, pure energy going to chemical elements, going to biological life, going into sentience, which, which is, you know, the humans have the most advanced brains, and now we are creating robots and computers, and when you look at technology, just think what the next 100 years will bring, or the next thousand, or the next million years, and we could be on Earth for 100 million years, even though, you know, a, a Christian might be thinking, well, Jesus is going to come tomorrow, it's all going to be over, but... If you have a scientific view, we might be here for another 100 million years. So think about what computers will be like a million years from now. This is, this is the importance of what I uh, say is my medical engineering. Next slide. Um, so now my next section is some, these are two points that we decided to talk about tonight so we can focus in instead of talk about everything. Uh, one claim from a creationist would be that Biological evolution is statistically impossible, and the other claim is that there's no evidence for macroevolution at all, which is, a, which is a one species going to another species. Okay, so one thing I just wanted to warn about, I don't think Bart does this, but some people say like, well, I know evolution is not true because it's just so, uh, life is so amazing and so complex, it's just too wonderful, it just cannot happen by itself. I want to give you the idea that um, you can't say that it's impossible or it can't happen because that is mathematical language of statistics. It's math. It needs to be calculated. You can't go by feeling on this. And one thing Richard Dawkins talks about, which I think is a very powerful antidote, is saying that, you know, we evolved to middle world kind of thinking. We understand three minutes and three miles, but if you say something is three light years, we don't really grasp it. You know, three light years, six light years, it's all the same to us. I, I have no idea how far that is. I can't really comprehend it. But if you tell me three, three uh, miles or three minutes, I know the difference between three minutes and six minutes because that's my world I live in. 
in the same way, I work in a computer company, and we, we're down to the nanometers, which is a billionth of a meter. And we, you know, we can't imagine that. And I know you're thinking, well, how do you see something that small? Well, we zoom it up. We, we have a zoom function, so we just zoom all the way in. Next. Um, so biological, so somebody like Barr will say, well, um, on page 35, in fact, you show some calculations. This shows that it's statistically impossible. My point I'm trying to make here is you cannot calculate the, uh, the probability if you don't know the process. For example, if I, had a deck of, if I had a bunch of cards here and I said, what are the odds of pulling out an ace of hearts? Somebody might say, uh, well, it's 1 in 52. Um, that's perfectly fine as long as it's a standard deck. But if you ask me, is that a standard deck, and I don't answer, you can't say, well, I know it's 1 in 52. Let me show you all the calculations. It's obvious. What if I replaced all the aces or all the red cards or made them all aces, you know? It, it could be 0% or 100%. So all these assumptions mean nothing. So until you know how the process happens, you cannot calculate the, the statistical probability of it. And I've seen people do this, on, this mistake on both sides. One saying, statistically, it's impossible that life could arise from non-life. And the other one says, no, statistically, it's possible. Either way, until you know the process or even get a hint of how it could happen, which we don't have, there's no way to calculate it. So I'm saying it's, it's bogus to, to calculate any kind of probabilities. Um, there's a, now about evidence for evolution. There's a, just, I'm going to focus just on the DNA evidence because I think it's the most conclusive and it's also extremely rich and new. Uh, since the year 2000, we've had the human genome uh, sequence and since then also other animals. And this is a field called genomics where you can compare the DNA across animals and you can see the changes happen. Uh, with, just like they descended. So really either there's descent happened or else uh, there's some kind of creator who's trying to deceive you by making it look like it happened when it really didn't. Okay, so next line. For example, on YouTube, this guy is an uh, evangelical Christian scientist and he has this long video about all the evidences for evolution because he's trying to teach his evangelical Christian brethren the evidence for it. And I'm going to go over one of those slides that he presents. Uh, next line. So he basically talks about comparing the genome across uh, human, chimp, dog, and fish, and you can see a lot of changes here. The top line is human, the next word says HS, PT is chimp. Um, this is only a partial listing of the DNA for insulin. Okay, and so what you see here is um, there's groupings of uh, three, uh, DNA nucleotides. Every grouping of three maps to an amino acid, and this long amino acid sequence makes a protein. So what you find out is when you look at humans and um, chimps, for example, you'll see that the amino acids are kind of the same. Uh, well, you know, they are pretty much the same, except for there's one change there. So you say, like, why would they be the same if there wasn't some kind of common descent there? Well, somebody might argue, well, uh, just they have the same kind of function. Well, when you look at the other uh, animals, you know, um, like the fish and the dog, you know, you can see the changes gradually happen more and more. So, another thing I wanted to mention, uh, for example, on here is, um, so, so that's one, that's on the, uh, the amino acid level where there's three nucleotides coding for this. Okay, now if you go up one, you'll notice the actual code behind these. Um, for example, uh, alanine over here, oh, well, um, no, let's say um, leucine, for example, here, we have CTC and CTG. Well, what is the code for leucine? There is no one code for leucine. Um, for example, leucine could be um, CTC, CTA, CTG, CTT, uh, TTA, TTG. Any of these combinations would pull the same exact amino acid. And in fact, here you can see the code's different, but it's the same exact amino acid. That means once you have this amino acid, this, this is irrelevant. This is what your body is reacting to and using. So what this shows is that um, there are a lot of different combinations that could have been made, but what happens is just a certain random one was chosen for that amino acid. And now look what happens. It turns out there's a one bit difference between this one and this one. So it's easily, easily there's some kind of relationship there. It's kind of like if you looked at two papers and you're a teacher, and you say, hey, look, this guy copied from this guy. There's so many different ways he could have wrote this, and they wrote it the same, and there's one change. 
So this, this is the obvious um, change that you have. Now the argument he calls this is redundancy because there's so many redundant codes for an amino acid, but it just so happens to use the same code. So if there's an intelligent designer behind this, you think, well, if this, if this really wasn't the set, then he's trying to fool us to make it look that way, like he's trying to deceive you. And of course, people who believe in God don't think they're God to deceive them. Next slide. Um, then there's a signs of unintelligent design, such as the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which goes, it's supposed to go to your brain, to your voice box, and it turns out it goes and loops around the heart. Well, there's no reason for that, but when you look at evolution, we know why it happened, because of the fish, it goes direct from the fish, but as uh, a sea animal went to a land animal, the neck elongated, and part of that got trapped into the heart. And so the most absurd example is in an elephant where it has like a 20-foot trip all the way down to the heart and back again, but it only needs just to go to, to the, the head and the neck. The giraffe. The giraffe, sorry. I don't know what I said. Um, next slide. Um, oh, yeah, so this basically shows how this is really, here it is short in the fish, and it gets as a, became a land animal, got a little bit longer now in the giraffe. It goes all the way down here and back here, and it only needs to go right here. Next slide. Another sign of unintelligent design is a, we have this non-coding DNA. We don't need it. It looks like junk. Well, how do we know it's junk? Well, one scientist said, let's delete a whole bunch of it. They deleted over 2 million um, nucleotides. And then they compared it, and they found out there's, there's, with these modified mice, there's no difference between the wild ones. Next. And then maybe if there's an ID designer, too, maybe he's evil. Like, this is what Mark Twain said. It's like... Uh, Flies are so good at spreading infection. They go to a kid with goopy eyes and goes to a dung and spreads the disease that way and all these plagues and everything by, by spread by the fly. You think of a human, if we found out a human designed this fly and let it go, we'd probably say this guy's created a weapon of mass destruction. Let's put this guy in jail. It's kind of like a Hitler kind of guy. Next slide. So basically that's it. Probability, I don't think you can cap it because we don't know the process. And the second one is... Uh, the evidence for evolution, I only, I only touched a little teeny part, but I think it's very convincing and powerful on the DNA. That's it. twice a week and we put on all kinds of events such as this one. Um, we highly recommend that if you're a student to get involved. Maybe even if you're not a secularly minded person. Yeah, uh, we have coffee and cookies in the back, so really hot in this room, so we should have actually gotten a nice one. My apologies. If I wish, even uh, after one hour, when, before we do the Q&A, let's take a break so I can just uh, spread out the tape. Uh, it only takes about 20 seconds. setting up. Oops. This talk is based on a book I just had published earlier this year. It's pretty unique. It's a purely analytical discussion about evolution. And what's unique about it, two things. Number one, there's no, it's, it's a purely scientific discussion. And it's peer reviewed by two 
evolutionary biologists who disagree with everything I say, one from UCAL Berkeley and the other from Oregon State. So you see my views and you see their opinions of my view. So, I'm going to talk about why I don't believe in evolution. Just to define it, evolution by the National Science Foundation is modification with descent from a common ancestor. The mechanism of change is mutation, migration, genetic drift. Of these, mutation is the mechanism for changing genes. Migration, drift, natural selection concern just increasing the frequency of these mutants within the population. I believe in microevolution, changes within kind. I do not believe that one species could give rise to a physiologically different species. There are empirical limits to evolution, which are the microevolution limits based on observation and experience. The limits I've found is there's no ability to evolve reproductive isolation, nor an increase in physiologic complexity. No ability to increase complexity of pre-existing physiologic systems added by horizontal gene transfer. In my review of over 400 studies, there are no exceptions to these limits. Never observed. Evolution says that one species can give rise right to two different species which are completely reproductively isolating each other from each other, even in vitro. Um, this process has never been documented. Also never documented is increased in physiologic complexity. The bacteria flagellum, which is a little tail that makes it slim, is made of relatively few proteins. The eukaryotic one, or animal flagellum, has many more proteins. It has never been observed that one species can give rise to another species that has more body parts. Now, evolution has no science, has no evidence, has no science. These, are the, these standard textbooks are my references for science and logic. There's two types of theories and beliefs, those that are scientific, which are testable and are, have empirical evidence, such as the law of gravity, and those that are faith-based or non-scientific. Now, they can be true. You can, now, George Washington crossed the Delaware in 1776, but you can't do an experiment to demonstrate it. I believe in intelligent design, but I acknowledge you can't do a test for it, and there's no empirical evidence for it. I would put evolution in the same category as astrology, as a pseudoscience, because it's not testable, and there's no empiric evidence for it. I'll explain. Now, uh, uh, Truman and I actually agree on the, it seems like we agree on the criteria for science. And you can see my references, most philosophers and scientists agree. There has to be a test of the theory it needs to predict the phenomena or observations. It has to be falsifiable and empirical evidence. Now, the problem is arguments claiming the testability and falsifiability require mischaracterizing what the theory of evolution is. Uh, Nick Matsky, an uh, uh, evolutionary biologist from Cal Berkeley, says science is about proposing hypotheses and testing them. The fossil record is one such test. Evolution predicted that transitional forms would be found. The problem is evolution is not simply the static existence of transitional forms. National Science Foundation, evolution is descent with modification from a common ancestor. It's a dynamic theory, not a static theory. A more accurate test would be if you could see offspring from a common ancestor could modify into transitional forms in modern species. A biologist named Haldane said evolution would be falsifiable if you could find modern fossil rabbits from the pre-Cambrian era. This is mischaracterized. Evolution is not simply the static existence of different fossils at different times. It's a dynamic process that says that you can get descent from modification from a common ancestor. A more accurate way of falsifying it would be if you can show descendants from this pre-Cambrian ancestor could not modify into the modern rabbit. But this isn't falsifiable because it allegedly occurred over 507 million years. So why is evolution evidence not evidence? Well, because it's illogically interpreted. Now, um, logic is involved in making conclusions about your observations. There is deductive reasoning. Now, we have this conditional argument. So if, if it is, if A, if the condition is it's raining, then you, then it would uh, B, it would be wet, which is the consequence. Or consequence. So the condition raining would lead to it is wet. So if you affirm the condition or you um, uh, uh, you see that the condition exists, such as it is raining, you can with confidence say that it is wet. So if it is raining, it is wet. Now, but you turn things around and you have a, a logical fallacy called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So if you so if you affirm the consequent that is wet, the condition is raining is not necessarily true. In my research, this is by far the most common logical error in the field of evolution, and evolutionists just don't seem to grasp this concept. 
So, if evolution is true, then you would see the fossil record in DNA similarity. We affirm the consequent. There is, in fact, a fossil record in DNA similarity. Therefore, the evol evolution is true. We wrongly conclude the condition of evolution by affirming the consequent, um, which is the fossil record, and so on. Now, if the sun revolved around the earth, it would rise in the east and set in the west. We do see the sun rise in the east and set in the west. We're affirming the consequent. Therefore, the sun revolved around the earth. We wrongly conclude the condition by affirming the consequent. So, evolutionists say that the fossil record, DNA similarity, pseudogenes, biological diversity, all fit the evolution model. But observations that fit the model do not necessarily support the theory and could be wrong, as I showed you with the sun around the earth model. Any nonsense theory could be made up to fit a model. Science requires that a test of the model produce the observations. DNA similarity fossils are observations with their evolution only assumed. Another argument they use is plausibility reasoning. Evolution is the simplest, most plausible explanation for a fossil record and DNA similarity. Not true. Plausibility depends on prior observations. For some, so suppose you have a, uh, you come upon a destroyed trailer park in Oklahoma. There's no one around to tell you what happened. What do you conclude? That a microwave oven exploded or uh, there was a tornado that hit? Well, you know it's a tornado is the plausible answer from prior experience in other situations. No one's around to tell you what happened in this situation, but from prior situations you know that a tornado is the plausible answer. Well, evolution has never been seen to cause changes to the degree claimed by evolutionists, such as um, uh, causing transitions in fossils and making the DNA similar among various species. So, fair question. If evolution studies don't support evolution, then what do they support? I found two categories. They're either show microevolution, or the study is simply a description of comparative biology. The study simply compares DNA fossils and biochemical pathways and chromosomes of various species and simply assume that the evolution occurred. For microevolution, there is uh, invoked the fallacy of the slippery slope. The scientist sees a small change in a small time, and then by extrapolation, uh, says that there can be a large change over millions of years. But you can't say this because there's no empiric evidence for it. Remember, evolution says claims to be a science. Science is the discipline of determining the limits of what's possible in nature. The comparative biology studies, evolution remembers the theory of a dynamic process that the species of the evolutionary tree are ancestrally connected. But the evidence given in many studies are simply the tips of these branches, such as the, the DNA diversity. So in the studies, they commit the fallacy of affirming the consequent. They show these tips, such as the DNA diversity, and simply assume that they're connected by branches. Would it be possible? No, because evolution requires a phenomenon called complementary coevolution, which is where two genes must evolve simultaneously for intermolecular fit. Intermolecular fit is, is uh, done in nearly all biochemical processes. So intermolecular fit is accomplished by having two molecules uh, match each other, fit each other by virtue of their three-dimensional shape and electrical charges. These shapes and charges are determined by the DNA code, which is a series of A, G, C's, and T's, arranged in an order uh, similar to a computer code. <clears throat> Complementary coevolution required by evolution is impossible because a random mutation in one gene restricts how another or partner gene can, re can create or maintain intermolecular fit of gene products. Since genes can be hundreds of nucleotides, obtain the necessary permutations for protein intermolecular fit would be impossible. So this shows a, an animal cell inside the nucleus is the chromosome, and the chromosome uh, consists of a string of these billions of uh, A, G, C's, and T's uh, which make up the genes. So this is an illustration of the gene partner gene uh, concept. Oops. We have two genes. Anyway, the point is, is there are two genes. Oh, there we go. Okay. It is working. Okay, so you have two genes. They can be from different chromosomes. They produce a product. Each produces a protein product that fits and matches to make a function. Examples are on the left. There are literally thousands of these. You open up almost every any page of a biochemistry book, and you'll see this type of reaction. Now, um, 
if one of them mutates, you have pro problems. So the little red C on the bottom gene causes a change in its shape and charges, so there's no longer a fit between the molecules. So where this is important is in species-specific mating. That's one example out of thousands. A Soviet biologist impregnated female chimp with human sperm, and there was no fertilization. At Cornell University in New York City, in vitro fertilization attempt was done between human sperm and about seven other mammals. No fertilization despite direct sperm and egg contact. So, can evolution explain species-specific mating? Well, for fertilization to occur, there's pro one process is, uh, occurs is called the acrosome reaction, where the sperm and egg meet, their membranes fuse, the sperm deposits its uh, DNA material into the egg. But if they're different species, the receptors on the sperm and egg don't match each other, and so they can't be any mating between the two species. Sperm and egg receptors from different species generally will not fit. <clears throat> Evolution requires complementary coevolution of sperm and egg receptors to explain species-specific sperm and egg fusion. Excuse me. So, uh, chimp and man presumably came from a common ancestor. Uh, evolution requires that any mutation done in the sperm would have to be matched by a complementary mutation in the egg, such that the human sperm and egg can match, yet do not match, with the chimp. And it's my belief that this is statistically impossible because of all the little nucleotides needed to create these matching uh, complementary proteins. So, the statistical analysis that Truman was referring to is how easy is it to get complementary mutations in two genes such that the... Um, uh, now, they do know the nucleotide sequence of the sperm and egg receptors of chimp and human. Uh, there's a, at least a 300 nucleotide difference between the two. So the chance a common ancestor could get just six of these required mutations. Well, you must account for the fact that there's four nucleotides. The gene size is 1,294 bases long. So the chance of getting a mutation in the right part of the gene is 101 over 1,294 for the first one. For the second one, it's 1 over 1,293. So you do the math times six mutations, and it's statistically impossible to get the required six mutations in an attempt to close the gap between the 300 nucleotide difference between the two species. There's logistic problems in sperm and egg evolution. Evolution requires the belief that every egg mutation will overcome astronomical odds to mutate a fitting sperm at the same time and same place. It makes no, it does no good if the mutant sperm and egg are, are matching each other and mutating 300 years or 3,000 miles apart. And they also must not be outcompeted by the more numerous original sperm. So complementary coevolution, the significance of it, I think it explains the empiric limits of microevolution because involving reproductively isolated species and species with greater complexity would require complementary coevolution for intermolecular fit. So the theory of evolution does not meet the criteria for science. Arguments that say it does mischaracterize the theory of evolution. The reported evidence merely shows microevolution or describes biologic diversity with the evolution merely assumed. The empiric limits of microevolution, it has never been documented that that reproductive isolation could occur by evolution, nor an increase in physiologic complexity. And since there are thousands of biochemical systems that require intermolecular fit, their DNA sequence complementary coevolution would be impossible. And finally, the scientific validity of evolution does not depend upon the strengths and weaknesses of competing theories. If evolution is considered a science, it must meet the criteria: testability, falsifiability, and empiricism. That's all. Ten minute cross examinations, starting with Truman. Okay, if it's okay with you guys, the way uh, I usually like to do this in a debate is that I'll be in the driver's seat when it's my turn, and so basically when I ask a question, it's supposed to be interactive, and I can interrupt and things like that to try to get an answer out of the person without a lecture response or a sermon response. And then when the tables are turned, I, you know, I behave in the same way. I don't give a lecture response. We try to have a dialogue to see if we can interact with each other. 
Is that okay? Sure. Okay. okay, so it's not being rude to interrupt here. Okay. Um, did you start the timer? <coughs> Okay, can you give me like a one minute left? Okay, so I heard you use a lot of phrases. Um, this this certain thing has never been observed or documented, or can evolution explain this? And now one thing I want to bring up is there's a logical fallacy called appeal to ignorance. And this is when people try to say, can you explain this? Well, if not, that's evidence from my side for some reason. Not knowing something is not evidence for either side. You have to know that. You can't say, hey, you can't explain this, therefore it's my point. It's nobody's point. So it's totally irrelevant when he says, oh, evolution can't explain this or can't explain that. Of course, there's a lot of things evolution can't explain. And the theory is constantly getting re revised. So I guess my question to you is, do you understand that there is a logical fallacy called appeal to uh, ignorance? Yeah, I'm aware of it, but um, uh, but I'm not invoking it. The the issue is is that if there's so you're saying that because I say there's no evidence for it, evolution can't be true. No, no, you're trying to say like these certain things can't happen um, because we've never it's never been observed or 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 there's no way that we know that this could happen like the flagellum. How could that thing come to be? We don't know, therefore, as if it, therefore it's evidence against evolution. Um, I'm not saying that it's, what I'm saying is that evolution, <coughs> since it's part of science by those who teach it, requires to have evidence. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is there is no evidence for it. Um, and so it, it, my, my claim is that it's not a science because there's no, now you're saying, I think you're saying is that since there's no evidence, I can't say that it can't, I, I, I can't say that it could happen, well, or could not happen. Well, specifically, what did you say about the flagellum? Well, I say it's never been documented that a flagellum from one species can give rise to a flagellum with more parts of another species. Is that evidence against evolution? Or is that, uh, appeal, that, to, or is that, that appeal to ignorance? That that shows that there's a limit, uh, an empirical limit on what evolution can accomplish. No, I think it shows that we don't know, there's certain things we don't know. It's not a limit. If we don't know, we may discover it. It could be discovered tomorrow. That's, well, I, if it's discovered tomorrow, then it could be classified as a science. But until that evidence, since that evidence doesn't exist, okay. then it, you can't call it a sign. So what I'm saying well, well, is... Well, so, so anyway, we both agree in principle that if we don't know something, that's not evidence for either side, right? That's correct. Okay, I just, okay let's just leave it there. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, you don't... Uh, I think it's kind of a cheap shot to say uh, evolution is a, a core hypothesis without um, submitting a better one. I, I, I gave my presentation that we need... In science, we need to look at all available hypotheses and see which one stands, which one looks best in light of all the data. And you are not proposing an alternate hypothesis. You're saying, look how bad this hypothesis is. Why aren't you? Why aren't you proposing a better alternative? Because, well, the alternative I believe in is intelligent design. But the problem is, I'm not an expert in it, so I'm not very good at defending it. I believe in uh, computer science, but I'm not an expert in it, so I can't defend it. Um, and my thesis is not what a better alternative is. My thesis is that evolution cannot be considered a real science because it doesn't meet the criteria. Okay, so in the back of your mind, you think idea is a better alternative, but you're saying you don't understand it very well. Maybe once you understand it better, you'll say like, well, that's, maybe that's poorer than evolution. No, because evolution, again, has different uh, criteria. Not, see, uh, you can believe in things that are faith-based, like you can believe in historical events that are purely faith-based. But evolution is, has a different standard because it's called a science. There has to be empiricism mm -hmm. falsified testability. Okay. It's hard for me to believe something that doesn't meet any of the criteria so, and call it a, It's sort of a, it's a, a conflict of reason. Okay, so, so I try to make a very important point that in science, it's very important to look at all the, all the alternative hypotheses and see which one makes the most sense. And you're saying you're not doing that. You're only looking at one to shoot holes in it, and you're not looking at alternative hypotheses to see if they're any better. Mm. I do look at alternative hypotheses, but I'm not very good at defending the alternative. The, the topic today is evolution and whether mm -hmm. it qualifies as science and whether there's evidence for it. Okay. So, well, I think it would be helpful to tell people if you think idea is better, why it's better. Um, again, it's outside of my field of expertise, and I'm not very good at that. It would be a waste of everybody's time. We're here to talk about evolution, 
and why we think it's why you're here to talk about why you think it's a good theory, scientific theory, right, right. and I'm here to give the counter. -reply. Yeah, I want to make clear the reason why I think it's a good theory is because it's better than all the alternatives. And especially if you're going to write a book, I think you should know what all the alternatives are and say, I've studied all the alternatives and this is the best one. That's one way of approaching it, but that's not my, my approach is, okay. is I'm taking evolution at its, for what it's called. I'm, I'm challenging them on, on those who teach evolution that it's a science when it doesn't qualify. Okay. So I'm, I'm taking a very narrow focus on it so I don't get trapped into okay. things I'm not an expert. Do I have very much time or yeah. how much more time? Okay, good. So I gave evidence for the left recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve. Um, why isn't that obvious evidence for evolution? I mean, it's, it's explained perfectly through common sense, but it seemed like it makes no sense with ID. Why would somebody, like I was telling my son earlier, it's, it's like if you had a stereo in your car going to your speaker, but instead of going right to your speaker, you wrapped it around your engine and then came back to your speaker. Why would you design that? But with evolution, it makes perfect sense. Um, again, I don't know. See, evolution, the, re the reason the current like the laryngeal nerve is the way it is is because of the, the embryology and development, and not because of some ancestor. There's, there's been no, I, I don't understand the relationship between the route of the current laryngeal nerve and descent with modification. I don't understand well, the relationship. Well, in the fish, it's a direct connection. And then when you start to look at land animals, you can see where as the, the neck developed, it, it got stuck around, one of these nerves got stuck around the heart area. And so now that's the way it is, it's stuck there. So as the neck gets bigger and bigger in animals, like the giraffe, for example, it, it has no choice but to continue to just get bigger. And so... So what you're saying is that and, if evolution were true, you'd see a gradually longer recurrent, a recurrent original nerve. Well, if... I'm saying with evolution, there's a good explanation for why it happened, and we can see it progress through different animals. But with intelligent design, is there, evidence, is there, is there evidence for this explanation? The evidence is looking at looking at the progression through different animals, like the fish and then the land animals. And see, that's a, a, a problem I have with the interpretation. All you show, all you show are these static mm -hmm. differences among various species. But evolution is a theory that one gave rise to the other through process of random mutation, natural selection. That's what I, that's what I call um, my descriptions of comparative biology. Uh, that is involved in the, the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Evolution would give a gradually uh, lengthened recurrent original nerve, therefore evolution. We see the recurrent original nerve affirming the consequent, therefore evolution. So you're, 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 you're well, committing the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Okay. And you're not really, well, and you're not really showing that evolution occurred. Okay, let's talk about. So it's a nice hypothesis, but there's no evidence to support it. Okay, how much time do I have now? About two minutes. Okay, so let's talk about your um, affirming the conse the consequence. So you're saying uh, if evolution is true, you see transitionary creatures. We see some transitionary creatures, but not necessarily evolution is true. Is that what you're Correct. Saying? Okay, why are we seeing transitional cr creatures if they're intelligently designed? Again, I'm not an expert on intelligent design. Because basically, uh, evolution is all about the sound of modification. Now, if things were created individually, this is what you're saying, your alternative. If you're, if you're against evolution, what you're saying is things were created independently, without descent. Um, so if they were independently, there's no reason to have transitionary uh, creatures. Uh, Truman, you, you keep trying to get me to try to defend intelligent design, but I, I acknowledge I'm not an expert in it and I can't give an explanation for it. Intelligent design is a faith-based theory that requires no evidence analogous to the history of ancient Rome. There's no test you can do to, to see what year Julius Caesar was emperor of Rome. It's uh, purely based on the faith that written documents are true. And, and I, so I can't explain it. I'm not very good at it, just okay. like I can't explain computer well, engineering. Well, my, my point is, in the big picture, evolution is about descent with modification. And it sounds to me like you're saying descent with modification is not science and it's not real how it happened. So I'm saying, if, if there was not descent with modification, why would we see transitional creatures? If there wasn't, why yeah. would we see it? Yeah, I mean, if things were individually created, you wouldn't expect to see transitionary creatures. There's no point for it, unless you want well, to mislead somebody to think there was. That's a, that's a philosophical question. Why is there diversity among nature? Why are there a million sexually reproducible? I don't know. Well, I would just say it's logic, though. Well, but, you, you have logic for you. 
Well, deductive logic doesn't uh, lead one to s describe the diversity in nature to conclude evolution. Evolution, there's, because there's no demonstration of descent with modification. All you're showing is these endpoint tips of the evolutionary tree. You're not demonstrating that it's possible to make a connection among them. Okay. Right. Uh, we'll do a pause until the end of these uh, conclusions. The uh, Dr. Rask will give his cross-examination of Mr. Smith. Um, well, we discussed most of our, um, one thing you mentioned is that you talked about how I, you can't do any calculations because we don't know the process. Um, would you agree that if you don't know the process of evolution, then it's vaguely, then it's a very vague uh, theory and then it can't be classified as a science? Okay, there's actually two parts to evolution. There's a part that's a fact, and that's that we descended from other animals. That's the stuff we can deduce from looking at the fossil record and DNA and all that stuff. The second part is the mechanisms. How did it happen? And that's the theory part that's continually getting revised with new data. You know, like uh, Darwin had, Darwin came up with this and he had no idea of, of DNA whatsoever. You know, so... How do we know that it's a fact? What is the evidence that determines it's a fact? Um, like I'd like to put up here on the DNA evidence, we can see the bits. You can, in genomics, you can look and it's just like, like I said, if you're a, a teacher and you have a, a written assignment and these things come back, you can tell if somebody was copying or not. And so, so by looking at the DNA code in genomics, well, that's what it's obvious. So what you're saying is since there's similarity in DNA, then there must have been a common ancestor. Um, similarity, but not just similarity by itself. There's a thing called synteny where there are certain genes uh, for example, you might have a gene called ABC, and another genome, it's an ABC again. And th there's no reason for it to be in a certain order, but it's ABC here, ABC here. Sometimes it's flipped over, ABC, CDA, and sometimes there's duplicates in there. So it's always it, it's, it's trying to say what's the, what's the inference of the best explanation for this. Uh, how do you reconcile the fact that similar DNA among different species uh, connotes a relationship when empiric evidence shows that only uh, species that can mate with each other can have a common ancestor. Well, I'm not really sure, but again, you're, you're trying to, let's say I don't know the answer to that, or let's say science doesn't even know the answer to it, again, you can't use the appeal to ignorance as evidence for your side. It, it could be just there's an unknown there. It's not evidence. If science doesn't have the answer yet, like I said, Darwin knew nothing of DNA, and, you know, all right. Um, if uh, the chimp and human uh, sperm nucleotide difference of their receptors, if their difference is 300, and they're common an and they're presumably from the common ancestor, would you agree that there has to be at least a one one mutated 150 and one mutated 150 nucleotides, or one was the same and there was a 300 change? Well, see, this is, I think, a big flaw in your calculations is you're talking about nucleotides, which the real, the real thing is here is what they call a codon, which is a, a set of three nucleotides. Because nucleotides don't mean that much because of what I brought up here about redundancy. There's more than one way to code it. So even, being, even focusing on a nucleotide level, I think, is a mistake. I mean, that's a, I think that's a fatal flaw in your calculations. Well, you're, you're partially right. The, what they do is the three nucleotides code for amino acid. And it, we, you take into account redundancy, if there was a 300 nucleotide difference, to get the, the, considering the redundancy of the genetic code, at minimum there would have to be a 100 nucleotide difference. Okay, but see again, uh, my opinion is you can't talk of, you're talking about unknown processes. We don't, you, you can't calculate the odds of an unknown process. That's my point, that's my belief. So you're saying that the evolution of sperm and egg receptors is an unknown process? Um, I don't know. For me personally, it is. I don't know if the state of science is unknown or not. But if I agree with you, it's unknown. I, um, how, is, how is the, the DNA? I, I'm what saying is, your what calculations is, are... are if, you're, if your calculations are right on, I mean, this is something where you could write this up and have this peer-reviewed and make an accomplishment. Of, but... Like I said, I think it's a fatal flaw when you don't even take into account codons. Well, the codons would just decrease that 300 nucleotide difference down to probably 100. Yeah, but it, sh but it shows your calculations 
even on this superficial level of me not being an expert, that's even me seeing something like that. What else is in there that's wrong? All right. So you agree that uh, that the mechanism for changing the DNA nucleotides is by gram mutation, after selection, and drift, and so on. Yeah, and there's also what they call horizontal gene transfer is another thing that you know they discovered and Darwin knew nothing about. All right. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, we'll have concluding statements. Five minutes each. Sorry, Mr. John Smith. Okay, so this is a time where I make my comments on Bar's presentation. Bar makes a comment on mine, right? Okay. Um, I, I think, number one, um, it's, it's very bad science to just shoot at a hypothesis, try to tear it down without saying there's a better alternative. That's, that's, um, that's, that's not going all the way. And if you want to do science, you need to say these are the different hypotheses and this is the best one. This is what this book here, I'm promoting here, written by these two philosophy professors. Um, for example, out-of-body experience. That's an interesting idea. How can we study this? Well, there's like four or five different hypotheses. And they go through each one to say which one might be the most reasonable. That's what you have to do. You just don't pick one and say, let's see if we can tear it to shreds or not. And then assuming that the, you know, your favorite one is safely tucked away beyond reproach. You want to put them all up forward. I mean, put your own cherished one up there and see how well it compares against it. So I, I think that's a major shortcoming here from Bard of not looking at the big picture. Um, and then as far as, like I said before, the calculations, I don't think you can calculate the statistics of anything unknown. You know, an evolutionist do it also. They say, oh, the odds aren't that high. And so either way, I don't think you can do that. Uh, I think the, the laryngeal nerve right. is excellent evidence for evolution. Um, how else can you explain it? And, you know, Bart says he doesn't want to go there. He doesn't want to think about alternative explanations. He just wants to shoot down one. Um, so, let's see what else, if there's anything else. I think that's about it. Dr. Rex. All right. Um, my point of this talk is is focusing only on the theory of evolution. It's claimed by those who teach it to be a science. And to be a science, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what alternative hypotheses are. There are objective criteria that all most, almost all scientists agree on, that is its testability, falsifiability, and, and uh, existence of empirical evidence. Listed among those is not whether it's better than another theory. Whether it's better than another theory uh, is would qualify as what is a better faith if, if, you, if you're comparing two different faiths. But evolution, since it's called a science, it has more objective criteria it needs to live by. And that is the purpose of my talk, is to say it doesn't live up to its, the objective criteria of science. So its comparisons to other hypotheses is not relevant. And I ask, uh, I ask you to, you know, you people out there, you don't have to believe anything I say. The, one thing I've, I've learned in my discussion with the two collaborators with my book is they just don't grasp the fallacy of affirming the consequent. And uh, Truman, he, lit, he references that uh, repeatedly. He talks about if evolution and recurrent laryngeal nerve, if evolution and common then the degenerative codons, affirm the consequent, we see the recurrent laryngeal nerve, therefore evolution. It's, it's pretty standard, that's logic, basic logic 101, that that's an illogical conclusion. Now, you may say, you know, the rejoinder that you have is this is the best conclusion. Well, the problem is, in order to be considered a plausible conclusion, there has to be prior evidence to make it plausible. And that's my beat. There is no plot prior observable empirical evidence to make evolution a plausible conclusion to uh, the fossil record and so on. It, it just doesn't, it, it's never been shown to, remember my analogy about the uh, tornado destroying the, the, Oklahoma, city, the Oklahoma town. We, I mean, if you didn't see it, we know from prior experience that tornadoes can do that sort of thing. So for something to be considered plausible, there has to be prior direct observation from analogous situations of which there exists none. That's all I have to say. Okay, uh, we will take a small five, ten minute break. And then we will have a question and answer session that will be open to everybody. How long is the break? Uh, let's make it five minutes. And we're going to take this uh, one at a time.
try and alter and please try to either address your question to both or um, and you might have to speak up because we do not have mics that we can pass around. So the first question goes to Okay. Thank you. Uh, stand up, turn around, and you would. I mean, you can stand up and turn around so everybody can hear you. Just repeat. No, you're coming back. Primates and humans not being able to mate. Well, a common misconception is humans came from primates, and that's not true. Evolution says primates and humans are apes, and humans came from a common ancestor. Mm -hmm. So that, that totally makes that irrelevant. Second is I'm sorry, I missed, I missed that. What, what comment did I say that was irrelevant? I missed that. That, that chimps and humans couldn't reproduce. That's right. But we don't come from we don't come from one or the other. We come from a common ancestor. No, that then okay, well, go ahead. And you're, you're thinking in concepts of four or five thousand years. You're talking about humans have been around anywhere from hundred to two hundred thousand years according to most of well, Let's take one comment at a time. Okay. okay. So um, I, I acknowledge that the, the chimp-human thing is a, My point in that discussion was that uh, since there's a supposed common ancestor that gave rise to both man and chimp, um, and I pointed out that man and chimp can't reproduce with each other, my point is was to show that that phenomenon of one species giving rise to two different species that are reproductively isolated has never been observed. And if evolution were true, that would have to, you know, there would have to be evidence to support that. Go ahead. Again, you're basing your concept on four or five thousand years, right? You're a young earth creationist? No, I'm, I'm basing my construct, uh, concept on empirical evidence, which is the criteria for science. You're, suppo you're making this assertion, faith-based assertion, that over millions of years there could have been a common ancestor. But remember, the criteria for science has to be testable, falsifiable, and empiricism. There's no empirical evidence to show that that two species that don't mate had not a common ancestor that used to be able to mate. No one's ever established that that's possible. Go ahead. No. But just, just one comment that I just uh, throw in there too. Um, I think there's a good point here from the audience, and that is, you know, sometimes people think we evolved from the apes or from these other apes, but you know, really we're we're cousins. Uh, in the same way, yeah, a human and a chimp can't mate and make offspring, but neither can a human and a fish. And Dawkins said, if you go back 198, I think it's a million generations, what does our ancestor look like? It's a fish. So yeah, fish can't mate with humans either, but it doesn't really, I don't see how that really invalidates evolution. Well, okay. Uh, next question. Um, this is John in the back. Okay. Uh, I'm a theistic determinist, so I'm really at odds with both speakers. <laughs> I believe that I believe the Bible is very clear that God works through natural processes. How can you not buy that? Psalm 104. God I know the Bible is full of contradictions. Yeah. The Bible, God works through hey, natural processes, including what I call yeah. chronological. What's your question? Hey, what's your question? Yeah. 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 Okay, well, sir. Sir, uh, what is your question? <laughs> My question is. Why do you, how can you say there's no evidence for interspecies breeding? We're doing that experiments right now. We have all kinds of hybrids between species in the butterfly group you work with. I, I, I think you are very misleading in many of your statements. They simply aren't accurate. I acknowledge that there are some species that can mate with each other, but there are a lot of species that cannot. And if evolution were true, it would have to explain the fact that many species cannot mate with each other. Now, if man and chimp have a, a common ancestor, and man and chimp we know cannot mate by virtue of these artificial insemination experiments, um, evolution has to explain that existence. And if evolution is to be considered to be a science, there has to be empirical evidence to support it. There is no empirical evidence that creatures that cannot mate used to be able to mate by virtue of a common ancestor. That's a total faith-based supposition. That's exactly where our experiments are disproving. In fact, there is evidence. There's evidence for what? I'm sorry. That species that do not naturally intermate can be made to mate and produce offspring in the laboratory. That is. So what you're saying evidence. is there are some species that uh, used to 
be reproductively isolated. In nature, and they're reproductively isolated. In the laboratory, we can induce cross-mating, producing offspring. Okay, that's the opposite of what evolution shows. Evolution says that species that What's were... the point of it? You twist everything I say. I quit. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're, describing <laughs> you're describing the opposite, so we'll, we'll move on. Yeah. Uh, next question goes to... Uh, yeah. yeah, I just have a question for Mr. Uh, Truman. I'm just a little bit curious of, um, since you believe in evolution, uh, my question to you would be, what's your best evidence for um, uh, for life coming from non-living material? Like, how did that happen mm -hmm. since... Yeah, nobody know? knows that yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, how, <laughs> now, now, this is what I said. Remember, don't do the appeal to ignorance. That's a, that's a logical fallacy. You can't say, because we don't know that, that's evidence against evolution. It's not. Well, there has, to, there has to be some kind of evidence because how did life start? There must be some kind of explanation. If there's yeah. no explanation, then how can you be talking about DNA? How, the, if you I, don't I, know have how a, I have a reason. That was last week. Well, I'm, I'm just you, saying, I'm just... <laughs> do you think um, it is a valid scientific theory that... Uh, do you think the biogenesis is a valid scientific theory? Or do you think it's a faith-based theory? It, it's a scientific theory, and the reason why is because it could be testable, and that's what they're doing. They're doing all kinds of tests. Like the person in the audience said, they had a talk here last week where a scientist gave an update on the origins of life and how this stuff came about, and he said these are the steps that are needed, these are the progress that we have in each step, these are the mysteries we have, these are the things we found in the lab. You know? Yeah, I've, I've read those studies, and all those studies are, are simply assertions, but there's no evidence to back it up. For example, there's this uh, gentleman... What do you think, like nucleosynthesis, the... the the elements being created by fusion and stars, do you think that's made up, or...? Well, that's beyond the scope of evolution. I, I'm talking well, about... Well, that's, that's all a part of it. I'm not talking about the cosmic evolution. I, I don't know. No, it's not. We're talking about Earth-like evolution, not cosmic. Okay. We have to stay focused here to have a fruitful discussion. Okay. So, I've read those... There's a man named... Jo, uh, a gentleman named Cavalier-Smith, who developed all sorts of scenarios of how life could have evolved. He talks about... Um, oh, Ob cells, which are um, uh, lipids that come together analogous to soap bubbles, and from those soap bubbles, you get proteins. And when you read those studies, all it is is just a simple hypothetical concoction, and there's no empirical evidence to back up that these things are possible. So I, I, I understand that there's these theories out there and people, but what it is is just a series of assertions with no empirical evidence to back them up. Well, it's a hypothesis and they're looking for evidence. And so this is what okay. science does. It tries to find out the unknown. There's a mystery there. Let's have a hypothesis. Let's figure out how to test it. So that's trying to unravel the mystery is what science is all about. Uh, are there any women in the audience who would like to ask a question? <laughs> Take you in the back. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I was a Christian at one point, and then I went back to the atheist group since we're all born atheists, right? And so I thought that I thought biology is so fascinating, I have to study it, and evolution is so fascinating, so I have to study it. So so, so many of these things you say, Doctor, just don't make sense because it's not really bringing up what evolution is all about. So, for example, so we have a For one thing, species don't interbreed usually. They don't produce viable offspring because they're sterile. So that's not how evolution works. Like the man over here said, that we branched off from a common ape-like ancestor about six million years ago. So that's how that works. We have Fred and Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a, a question for yeah. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, scientists have not debated evolution for about a half a century. And um, so I was wondering, how can you believe in something that violates the laws of sciences, science like physics and chemistry? Did everybody hear that? No. 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 Sorry, what do you mean? Well, well yes. we believe in intelligent design. Correct. Yet there's no peer-reviewed studies for intelligent design. There's Correct. thousands of studies that support evolution from a variety of scientific disciplines. So I'm wondering how you can how can you even just disregard thousands of scientific studies that are peer-reviewed and follow the scientific method, which means they they can be duplicated. And evolution typically Macroevolution, what you creationists like to refer to, 
occurs over millions of years. So how can there be empirical evidence? But you Baby can dolls. see, Baby right, and empirical evidence isn't always the method that scientists use because do we see gravity? There's empirical evidence that indicates it. Yeah, so and there's empirical there. evidence that you can see transitional fossil species. That for every major transition. Okay, well, that's enough. I'll, I'll address your points. So one point was empirical evidence of transitional fossils, correct? Yeah. All right, fallacy of affirming the consequent. But transitional fossils don't indicate that one was derived from the other by random mutation and natural selection. Fallacy of affirming the consequent. Your other assertion was, uh, how can I believe in intelligence? Well, wait a minute, you didn't, you didn't answer that. Why do you see um, fossil, transitional fossil species all over? And you can see them going from um, land, from, the, from water to terrestrial. <coughs> That's right. There is, there is a, right. I understand. There's a variability in, in fossils uh, that can respond to different environmental factors, right? So we're seeing, seeing variability. But there's no evidence that this variability was derived by the dynamic process of evolution. And no one's ever seen it happen. There's no, it's not, it can't be considered a plausible explanation because there's no analogous uh, empirical evidence to say that it's plausible. The other point about intelligent design, well, intelligent That's design... I'm sorry, I have to Cytochrome C is a good In the interest of time, I think we have to Next question. All right. Troy. Speak up. Oh, sorry. I just had a question for the good doctor here. Um, is there any percentage okay. of a possibility that there's evidence for evolution? At all, like even one percent. Do I think? Yeah, is there even one? No, I, I think it's just impossible based on what I, I just showed you, uh, because you there, because the requirement for intermolecular fit, the long uh, nucleotide sequences that make up genes to make up these proteins that have to match each other, and that requirement. Now remember, a, a, a mutation one. For example, you have two genes that match that fit each other, like the, the sperm and egg of this ancestral primate. If you, if uh, the sperm mutates toward the presumptive chimp, any mutation away from the wild type would be extinct because it would have nothing to mate with. Right. Um, so that's my big beef with it. Well, my my really simple question was: Is there any possibility that evolution uh, does actually happen? Microevolution only. Okay. I think that the restraints of the long nucleotides of the, of the DNA that make up the protein shapes make it so randomly mutating the correct molecular shapes and charges uh, would be just statistically impossible to have them all magically fit in tens of thousands of biochemical processes that make up life. Yeah, so my second question was um, how can you not accept uh, one theory that has some evidence, but totally accept a, a different theory that you says requires no evidence at all. Well, I don't think evolution has any evidence, and all of the evidence is universally misinterpreted. So, so both theories that we're talking about have zero evidence. Correct. I, intelligent design has no evidence. It's a faith-based theory. So why do you pick that one instead of the one? It's, it's more intellectually honest. In uh, because <laughs> see, evolution, <laughs> evolution, <laughs> thank you. evolution is claimed to be a science by those who teach it. Yet clearly, it doesn't meet the criteria of science. So on the one hand, it's taught as a science. On the other hand, it doesn't fit the criteria. Is the Bible science? No, it's not science. <laughs> Neither is the history of Rome science. Okay. There are evolution. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, trying to wrap my head around the... Lack there are, there are, there are faith-based theories and beliefs, and there are scientific ones. I, I want to make just a really quick comment. Uh, side note. Sometimes creationists, and I haven't heard Bart say this, so I don't know if he agrees with this or not, but sometimes they look at symbiotic relationships and say, this has to be designed together. For example, uh, bees and a flower. They, the flower needs the bee, and the bee gets the honey from the flower. Um, how could these things independently independently arise. Well, I think an interesting thing to consider though too is that's a beneficial symbiotic relationship. There's also some where there one harms the other, such as tapeworms. And there's also, you know, anybody has a tapeworm, no, no. Uh, the other the other one is somewhere there benign where they 
they're just mutually, they don't, they don't hurt. So I mean, there's like three possibilities of symbiotic relationships. So. Uh, so I'm a biochemist, and I just really need to address this idea you have between the lock and key bottle of an enzyme. The thing that you need to realize is that 95% of that enzyme can be modified with no change whatsoever in function. So it's really only a small portion that you're talking about that has to, that can't be changed. So really, we can have a series of small gradual changes to an enzyme, and if I make one little change, it's really not going to have any major effect on how it interacts with its gene partner. This can accumulate over a long period of time where small changes eventually add up to where they no longer interact, but it's, it's a false assumption to say if I change you know, one or two little nucleotides, it's going to cause no function to fall apart, because really we can change almost most of them with plenty of interactions still perfectly viable. So I guess my question is kind of why, what is wrong with the idea that small changes eventually add up to a large change? There, in there, that sense. there are two problems with your um, statement. One is that the, the theory that there can be large deviations uh, is not based on one enzyme within one species. What it is, it's based on a survey of enzymes among various species that have similar um, functions. For example, uh, there is the enzyme peptidase, which is a little bit different between man and fish. And, but they both have similar function, but they have very different structures. Now, the problem is, now that's where this assertion where you come, that you say comes from, that, that two molecules can have the same function, but the problem is that same function is in different species. They're under different regulatory processes. Now, the other thing that you mentioned was that there can be a lot of changes with, uh, within an enzyme. And, now, I acknowledge that there can be a few changes without um, a messing up a function out of a few amino acids in, in uh, various enzymes that can be changed. But there was actually a study that I'm looking at right now on my computer, how protein stability and new functions trade off. Many enzymes, there's a study done, uh, and I'll show you the reference later, right here if you want, that uh, where they changed a few, in, a few um, amino acids within an enzyme and it still had a little bit of the function at the cost of the stability of the enzyme structure that started to unravel. So your statement about a huge uh, acceptance of enzyme variability is uh, not very accurate because those are simply different enzymes within different species. They're able to accommodate different structures because they're under different regulatory processes, yes? But genetic diversity in a single species is by definition, it results in structural changes like the ones we're talking about. You can, I mean, absolutely, you can change one amino acid and destroy the functionality of a protein, but it has to be a very specific one in the active side of the enzyme. For the overall structure, you can change them all you want. I mean, not all you want, but you can change a huge variability within them, and there's very little change. I mean, that's how we identify active site as a biochemist. You sit there and you say, okay, I'm going to compare across a lineage, and I'm going to find which amino acids are very conserved, and those ones are probably actually crucial to function, but most of them aren't crucial to function. You can change them free, freely, basically. Well, there's, there's a difference. There's the active site and there's regulatory sites. Uh, and, and so there's, I agree with you that there's some leeway. Where we differ is in the degree of leeway and the statistical possibility of generating the nucleotide sequences to generate one enzyme to fit another one. I, I think our difference is a matter of degree. We'll go on. Oh, so I guess my uh, we, we uh, uh, we, we question hasn't been answered. Well, well, why is can we just see if he has his I think yeah. it's important to engage with the audience to. Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Biochemist. <laughs> if there's something new to add, one last comment. Oh, uh, just the original question why a bunch of small changes can add up to a big change? In, in, uh, it, in terms of an example, enzyme. In enzymes? Yeah. Uh, it depends on, well, because those enzymes have to react with another molecule. But, and, but my, my original point was that even if, if there's a small change, the other molecule will be able to interact with it just fine because it doesn't really change it that much. It takes a long time of a lot of small changes and the interplay between the two to actually have a large effect in the end that results in speciation. Okay, we'll move on to another question. Um, I'd like to point out, though, that that is the volume that is required in this room. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, thank you. I have a question for both of you. Um, so I would like to know what, for each of you, what specific scientific evidence would you require 
to change your position with respect to evolution? Well, let me just answer real briefly. For me, I would, it would, like I said, my whole point was we have to look at all the hypotheses to see what the best alternative is. And I'd have to see a better hypothesis, you know, a better alternative. Um, so if there's a better alternative, that would sway me. And I don't see a better alternative for now, of course. So. The evidence that would sway me is if one could see the progeny of a species give rise to reproductively isolated species. And I mean isolated in every way, even by in vitro, and also uh, have a physiology of different, of an increased complexity. If I saw that, I would change my mind. I haven't seen it. The gentleman standing to the side. Okay, so I'm saying, by the way, um, so just to clarify real fast, uh, you're saying that microevolution can't lead to macroevolution, and you're yeah. defining macroevolution as a change in reproductive capability and morphological state. Okay. Um, so my real question is, given the recent um, kerfuffle that we have with like different microorganisms turning into other microorganisms, do you not consider that a change in species, or is that just not quite big enough, or I'm just confused about that? Um, my criteria for different species, see, see species, I acknowledge that species can be taxonomically classified as different, but they might be physiologically the same, such as Lions and tigers are taxonomically classified as different, but they can reproduce and have fertile offspring. So even though they are classified as different, I acknowledge that they probably could have had a common ancestor. If they have different numbers of body parts, no one's ever shown that it's possible that they could have had a common ancestor. So my criteria for different... Now, so you might have bacteria um, cultured repeatedly, and someone might, in fact, actually, there was a study, E. coli typically does not metabolize citrate. And one uh, microbiologist was ag gradually able to change it so it did metabolize the compound citrate. And since the microbiology, I have a degree in microbiology, by the way. And so since the microbiology, one of the, the ways we, we determine whether or not a, a, an organism is E. coli is whether or not it can metabolize citrate. But the problem is, so that might determine its taxonomic classification, but there's no change in the complexity. There's just a change in one enzyme. That's, that's the difference. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe, maybe that answer your question. Yes, I'm confused about what you mean when you say complexity. Because it sounds complexity like is saying... more parts. Okay, so... A flagellum, I don't think a creature that has 20 flagellum could evolve into a creature with 20... With a flagellum with 21 proteins could evolve into a creature with 22 proteins. Okay. It's never shown to happen. So... The, um, what is it called? The grenade, grenade beetle? The, that Bombardier. beetle that grenades me. Bombardier. 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 Bombardier, thank you. Uh, anyway, so that um, insect, uh, we've act there's actually insects there that we know <coughs> used to be insects that turned into those insects, and they're all kind of coexisting right now. Is that, that seems like it would be a pretty significant part to add, and that's been added. Is that I'm not, not? I'm not familiar with that, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, the bearded gentleman in the middle. <coughs> Um, uh, first of all, I, I need to mention that I'm not an English uh, native speaker, so I need to, I mean, patient maybe to convey my ideas. Um, I need maybe, probably, I, I need just to point to a, a point, then ask a question. So I need your patient, it will take less than two minutes for sure. So, um, I'm a medical doctor myself, um, and I have researched this, um, I mean, notion of, uh, of evolution for a long time. And I come to the conclusion that, uh, as exactly as Dr. Rasp mentioned, um, and he brought up many, many um, evidence, there's tens and tens, maybe hundreds of evidence as exactly what Dr. Rasp said. So, uh, in my end, I have no doubt that the evolution is, is false notion and it does not, um, uh, it, it isn't true. Um, but um, let's say that evolution is okay, just in the sake of the argument. Um, um, does this, I mean, prove that, uh, which is really what's important to me and maybe to a lot of people, uh, God exists? Um, well, let's say it is okay, but not, evolution is there. Does it prove that God exists, or does it maybe prove only that maybe the Bible um, um, idea of God or how he created a human being through 7,000 years ago or something like this is false? Uh, does it prove um, that science conflicts with the Bible, or does it, or, or maybe the Holy Book, or does it prove that the science conflicts 
only one version of the holy books. So, um, uh, what if there's a book from God yeah, um, that says, uh, that, that does, does not contradict anything of the science, and at the same time it, is, it has some scientific evidence. Um, if this book speaks good about, I mean, about a lot of things, I mean, that makes sense. He speaks good about Jesus. About, uh, and in the same time, he's, he, uh, the book mentioned a lot of scientific <laughs> evidence that was, was, was not discovered until the last two centuries. That um, um, I believe God, when he created us, he did not leave us loose without having a really solid evidence. Uh, it is, I, I said two minutes, it is just a little bit longer. Without, without, without a really solid evidence that guides humans being to him. He does, does not uh, leave us loose. So, um, um, I mean, this, this evidence might be not that, I mean, popular, but it is a test from God to see whom follows the science and the common sense and whom not. So I just give some examples. So, what, is, what is your question? What is your question? I, I, I'll come to my question. Just I'll continue this. So, so if there's a God, so, yeah. So, the question. Just say your question. I would say the question. So if there's a book from uh, from God that's really have a, a solid uh, information um, uh, that that was not discovered until two one century or two century years ago, um, and and does not reflect with the idea. Of, uh, this is the question, by the way, to uh, Mr. Um, uh, Trump, uh, Tr Truman, I think. Yeah. So, that, that, that does not contradict, you was looking for a notion, a, a, an alternative no a notion that you can adopt. So, if there's, I mean, a book from God that says, uh, I bring a lot of scientific evidence that uh, wasn't discovered until the, the last 200 years, and it was revealed 1400 years ago. And this book does not have any contradiction in the science in the, in the, in the, I mean, in the sense of uh, scientific things, like the, the, the ground is not, it's not flat, actually it says the ground is... is uh, okay, are you, are you inferring, are you talking about the Quran? Yes, the Quran. Okay. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the Quran and what it has to do with science, because uh, I come from a Christian background. Let me just say briefly that... Um, you know, this is a theology question, and theology, there's different theologies about how you deal with science. For example, on one extreme is take the Bible in the most literal way, that's young earth creationism. They deny, they deny modern cosmology and modern biology. Some Christians say, like, oh, well, you know, we could accept modern cosmology. Those are called old earth creationists. Um, but they reject biology as far as evolution. Then there's also the next step to say, hey, I, I accept all of science. The Bible has nothing to say about science. These are called evolutionary creationists. This is kind of a new thing. Biologos.com is a major website for this, and Francis Collins is a major Christian coming out with this. And so every one of these positions has different aspects. And I think one thing that's interesting here, um, you know, Bart is not really telling his alternative, but, you know, I, I know that he's... What? Okay, uh, I mean, there's a whole scientific uh, approach he's coming from. Like one, I said on, on theories, when you look at a, ho a hypothesis, you look, how does your theory go against the background science? And, you know, the background science for younger creations is that the whole universe is 7,000 years old or so, and there's a worldwide flood. I mean, you're, of course you're going to look at the whole world totally different than if you look at an ancient universe that's 14 billion years old. Okay. Uh, do we have any more women who have questions? <laughs> okay, so excuse my lack of articulation, I'm a little nervous, but um, I heard recently that humans actually share more similarity, similarities to some non-animal things than they do the chimpanzees. Uh, I can't remember exactly what, I was trying so hard to remember what the example was, but I did find that we share 50% similarities to bananas in our DNA. So, I'm just wondering, do you know anything about that? Um, yeah, I, I, I've heard that, and uh, I've had to get the biologists in the crowd for the answer on that one. Um, well, one, um, one thing is that um, uh, there's, actually there are some similar, there are similar functions that all life does. There's transport um, nutrients across cell walls, there's proteins, there's membranes. And so that's why you can account for the similarity of DNA, because there are similar life functions common to all life. Nutrient transport, metabolism, growth. Well, and I will say too, like I said, genomics is a, a new field where we're learning so much by looking at animals. And when you look at 
look at the animals, you can see how the DNA code kind of tickles through it. There's, there's obviously footprints of the scent there. And if you look at something like a banana, you're not going to see that with a human. You know, you're not going to... So I, I guess I would dispute that uh, we would have more connection with a banana than a chimp or something like that. No, obviously we don't have more connection with a banana, but I'm saying there are some things that we actually do share more in common with than a chimpanzee. Yeah. I guess that's something to look into. I'm not sure about the assertion of it. Okay. Um, the gentleman in the hat in the back. I have uh, two short questions, one for each speaker, so cut me off if I'm taking too long. Um, so first for Arden, I guess you've said a couple of times that you don't think it's fair to criticize a theory without suggesting alternatives. Um, and I wonder why you hold that position. Let me leave with an example. So. Suppose I've been looking at numbers and I saw that 3 was prime and 5 was prime and 7 was prime. And I proposed a theory that all odd numbers were prime. Would you need to present an alternative theory of which numbers were prime to criticize that theory? Well, see, here, um, no. No, I mean, it's good to say, look, this, this, this evidence does not line up, but you don't say, I'm going to throw it out because I think it's a better theory, but I don't really understand that better theory and how it stacks up and things like that. If, if you're going to, if, with your prime example, you're, you're going to say, what is a prime number? How do you define a prime number? And you're going to, you're going to, you're going to have alternate hypotheses on that. But do you have to suggest one? Because I would say, no, you should just say, well, 9 is odd and it's not prime, so your theory is bad. Well, Let's look at it this way. Let's say, let's say, for example, everybody agrees on the theory of gravity. But uh, let's say, for example, I don't believe in it because I believe in Santa Claus, and Santa Claus violates gravity all the time because of Christmas magic, and that's perfectly fine. And so when you tell me about the theory of gravity, I'll say, no, no, look at all these problems with the theory of gravity. And you say, well, what's your alternative? It's like, I'm not going to open my mouth and talk about Santa Claus. No, uh, I just, they got problems with gravity. That's it. It's like, why don't you come clean and say, hey, I believe in Santa Claus, and I think it's a better theory, you know? So second question? Yes, yeah, so second question um, for Dr. Bark. So you've talked about affirming the consequent many times. You've brought this up, this uh, logical fallacy. So this is a fallacy in deductive logic. When we say that you're saying if A implies B is true, it's not necessarily the case that B implies A. Okay, so do you believe that science is deductive? Because I would argue that science is inductive. Correct. And scientific induction rests fundamentally on affirming the consequence. We look at many examples and we say that they give evidence for a theory. Um, I, uh, well, there's a little bit of nomenclature. Um, if inductive reasoning or plausibility reasoning, uh, you can make a conclusion by induction if there's prior observations from analogous situations. If there isn't any, then it's the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So if A then, for example, if it's, if it's raining, it must be wet. But if it's wet, you can't with certainty say that it's raining. But it's raining is plausible. Right. And it now, we know it's plausible. It's we, now, we know it's plausible only because of prior observations from analogous situations. That is the key thing. Prior observations from analogous situations, of which in evolution there isn't any, so it commits the fallacy of affirming the consequent. That's my point. Ah, so you were saying maybe that the original claim that A implies B were true, that has not been established. No, I agree. If evolution were true, you would see transitional fossils, but you can't reverse it. Okay. How is that different than the rain example, then? Maybe I don't know. Than the what? The, your, your rain example. I mean, uh, so prior experience from prior experience. But what has prior experience established? That if it's raining, then it's wet? Well, we know from prior experience that wetness can be caused by rain. Mm -hmm. We don't know from prior experience that transitional fossils was due to evolution. There's been no prior... No, no, but in this context it would be that if evolution were true, then we would have transitional fossils. I agree with that. Okay. Then isn't it scientific induction to go from if we have transitional fossils, that provides plausibility for evolution? Only if there's prior, it's plausible only if prior direct observations from other analogous situations. I don't understand. Right, we'll, we'll take another question. All right, you ask me well, after class. Look, I just let me just clarify. I think the problem here is that um, with evolution, if evolution is true, you can say there's going to be transitional fossils, okay? And I think what Barb is saying is like, well, you know, there there may be another alternative where maybe it's not evolution, maybe some other thing where if that's true, you also have transitional fossils. So finding transitional fossils doesn't necessarily 
uh, mean evolution. The problem is, his alternative is ID, which says there would be no transitional fossils, so it's not making sense there. Well, here's my challenge. I challenge that evolution is a valid alternative because there's no prior observations or experience to make it a plausible conclusion. That's my key challenge. I didn't, I didn't know your question. All right. Um, the claim is that you think evolution is a better alternative than ID. Mm -hmm. Okay. What makes evolution better? Why is it better? Because of the evidence, I would say. Yeah, but all the evidence commits the same fallacy in interpretation. Well, uh, yeah, so this is where, what's the best interpretation? Let's look at all what the different, makes it, inter what the different makes interpretations it? or different hypotheses. All right, here's the key thing. Evolution has to meet other criteria. If it's called a science, it has to meet criteria of empiricism and falsifiability. So you may say it's better, but it might not be scientifically. But it is still, you may think it's better based on your opinion and based on faith. But you can't say it's a scientific theory because it doesn't it still doesn't meet the criteria. Okay, well we can move on to the next question. Mr. Uh, so thanks. So you know, reading the paper that we got, I think the original question here is, is there any good evidence for evolution? So I'm I'm kind of wondering why we keep going off of that instead of arguing why, Mr. Truman, there's evidence for, is there good enough evidence for evolution, you keep kind of putting it off on DeBart as though he believes in intelligent design, so let's kind of blow holes in that. And in your statements and in, in your presentation, you said, well, we can't do that. We can't take something and kind of blow holes in it unless we say that there is another alternative that's better. But that doesn't seem like the best evidence for evolution. I mean, if that were the case, then really the stork gives babies because when you're four <laughs> that was the best sure when theory. you're four right sure but so four, but it yeah so so you're saying that this is the best evidence is because it's it's all we have there's no other alternative so it must be fact it well, must be true well, like i said we have facts in the world and yeah. the hypothesis is trying to put these facts together in a picture and so you look at see what's the best hypothesis what's the best explanation this is called Parsimony, what's the most parson parsimonious with the data? And I don't see any problems with evolution. There's unknowns, but that's the appeal to ignorance to say, ah, oh, you can't prove that, therefore, you know, it doesn't prove anything. But, but, but the fallacy that you're using is, well, it, it must be true because there's no other better explanation. Well, plus it makes sense. I mean, like I said, it's like there's footprints. When you look at different genomes, different DNA, you can see the footprints of, of changes. There's bits changing. Either the, those really did change, or through descent, or else somebody designed it and trying to lead you astray to make it look like there is I, I guess the statement is really just using a fallacy really to support that. Okay. Um, <laughs> next question we'll go to um, the gentleman in the back with the uh, hat. Okay, I have a question for both of you. Uh, it's, if certain harmful mutations kill or sterilize organisms, why would their lack of offspring matter when discussing discussing evolution? Why would a lack of offspring matter in discussing evolution? You uh, just restate the question. If certain harmful mutations kill or sterilize organisms, why would their lack of offspring matter when discussing evolution? I don't understand the relationship. Explain. Explain yourself. Because it's. Are you, are you addressing some assertion I made? Yeah, because if what they're dead or sterile, they can't have kids. But it's still a, con it's still a continuation in that specific species, right? Well, that's an anomaly. That's an, I'm talking about an entire population. But that's still evolution, right? I'm sorry, what's evolution? The, the mutations. Yeah. Uh, mutations are... Um, okay. Evolution is a mutation that's... Um, carried on through genetic drift and through random mutation and creating a new population with that mutation, not isolated individuals. That's Evolution is not isolated individuals, it's changes in population. I, I think uh, maybe what you're trying to say is you have these different organisms, some have some really bad mutations in that and nothing amounts to it, but then some of them have good mutations. So just because there's bad mutations, that doesn't dismiss evolution, it just says that it's not going to continue on or go on, all the other stuff does. Um, let's, 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 uh, so, hey, um, you know, I guess um, 
I had appreciate your time, by the way, um, here, and I think you guys are doing a great job. So I had this question. Um, I don't know your name, but the um, evolution fellow. Um, I, so my, 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 my question is, I'm sorry, Truman. So my question is, is like, um, like, let's say intelligent design is plausible, okay? And then um, I, I hear you characterize and say, well, let's not entertain like miraculous notions about science. And my question is, is it seems to me like the notion of design doesn't entail the necessity of a miracle by any by any notion. It entails like it was almost like you're saying miracle, uh, design is miraculous, or or is it or is it a notion that would say that you know complexity of a certain uh, magnitude would just by necessity entail design. And, Somehow that gets conflated with miraculous, with the miraculous, and I'm not sure if those two things necessarily go together. Could you explain why well, they do the, or if they do? Yeah, I think the uh, the ID proponents they say we don't identify the ID. So, for example, let's say there's an alien who designed everything, and that's that's perfectly fine. I mean, just like we analyze a watch and say, hey, that thing was designed. Maybe humans or animals were designed. So it's just a matter of looking at all the data to see if it makes sense. And and. One of the hard things where what they're trying to do is they're trying to prove scientifically how to identify this design. How do you how do you identify design? It can't be like, oh well it can't happen by evolution because that's just the appeal to ignorance. We don't know. So you can't say that's evidence for ID. So the ID camp is trying to figure out, you know, like SETI, for example, is looking for extraterrestrial signals. They're looking for intelligent signals. So they're trying to, that group is trying to scientifically look for some kind of markers or something, but from what I understand, there's no markers or anything that they can come up with. So. Hey. Uh, I'm really bummed that that dude left because I wanted to tell him something, and it's for anybody that kind of was thinking about what he was thinking about uh, evidence for life. The, well, I'm a previous student here, and the chemistry textbook uh, for the chemistry class here, the, just a general textbook, is really, really good at explaining like how life can develop from inanimate things. Right? It explains lipid layers. Uh, it explains how RNA can occur based on just in their studies that talk about it. So if that's interesting to anybody, I would highly suggest the, the chemistry textbook. Uh, okay, so my question is, so you do believe in microevolution. Um, do you think, though, that the only ingredient missing to make your jump from micro to macro is just time? Because essentially it would be time that could make the difference between uh, a species diversifying. Is it too well, separate? Yeah, oh, that's what an evolution is I don't think yeah. time can make up for the statistical, the statistical improbability the possibility of having multiple DNA nucleotide sequences in the right permutations to have thousands of interacting molecules. But you do believe in mutation, right? Because of microevolution. I believe in okay. So do you think, though, that it's possible that? I mean, it doesn't that assume that the nucleotides are essentially uh, moving at a fixed rate uh, with, with essentially uh, species moving along? It doesn't matter what rate they move at. But if a mutation can make a jump, I guess is what I'm saying. So assuming instead of taking 19 or to the negative 23 zeros of whatever your probability was there, do you think that mutation can account for that? So there might be these jumps that can overcome some maybe some statistical improbability. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. It's statistically impossible to have that. Even with mutation? <coughs> yes, mutations don't. Here's the thing. If you have rapid mutations, you'll just have a hodgepodge of nucleotides with no, with no purpose, with no fitting. They, the molecules need to fit uh, and interact with each other. It, for example, there's a, a blood clotting. I don't know if you, the doctor knows here. A blood clotting mechanism, there's what's called the coagulation cascades, a series of 12 proteins that all come together in perfect harmony after you cut yourself. They all fit each other in a specific order, and each of them is generated by nucleotides, which are probably dozens, if not hundreds, of nucleotides long. Yet they all fit, and because of the permutations are so massive, as I showed with my example of just six, I think it's statistically impossible to think that you can arrange those nucleotides such that they generate molecules, all of which fit together in perfect harmony, times a million. Mm -hmm. But then hemophilia comes about because of genetic mutation, so doesn't that kind of just, that basically is cutting your cascade at, at some level too? Right, well, that, that, that proves my point. It shows that uh, there's not much room for, for error. Now, I agree with the biochemist. But you can some... still procreate. 
Yes, of course. But, but we're talking about how it's generated to begin with. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about minor mutations after everything's all together. Mm -hmm. We're talking about how you can get from a coagulation cascade of six, which is in C squirts, for example, to a coagulation cascade of 12. I don't think it's possible, and no one's ever shown that it could happen. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but just one quick comment too. Uh, sometimes, I mean, we're overwhelmed. Like I said, we evolved this middle world idea, and we're just overwhelmed with uh, these amazing biochemical processes in the body. It's kind of like, you know, earlier humans, uh, or even a lot of people now, they can't imagine that the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles per hour. That's crazy. I don't feel it. A thousand miles per hour around the equator? It can't be spinning that fast. And we're going through space at 68,000 miles per hour. Are you kidding me? I don't feel that kind of wind on me. But this, this is the kind of thing that is just so much bigger than our world that we're used to. The lady in the back. Um, I have a question for Dr. Rath. Uh, you make a point to emphasize that the other have the come from prior experience. But many progresses that we have made doesn't come from prior knowledge. When Thomas Edison, he invented the light bulb, he didn't go I saw this one time that the illumination can be fueled by electric energy. He just quieted it until it became possible. So not all knowledge have to come from prior experience. How do you respond to that? Right. Well, you misinterpreted me. Yes. I didn't say all knowledge. You tried to right. say in order to right. uh, do induction, which is making conclusions from things you can see, there has to be prior experience. Now, your, your analogy about Edison is from direct empirical evidence. That doesn't apply. What I'm talking about is when there's not empirical evidence and you make jump to some conclusions of how something could have occurred when no one saw it. Edison actually did empirical direct observation. So the, the uh, prior experience of, uh, situation doesn't apply. The prior experience, in your case, is at the, at the time. I don't want to say what at the time means, because before the electric light bulb, what are the sources of illumination? Well, I don't know. If I, I don't understand. My point is, is that um, you can make scientific conclusions from direct observation. You can make conclusions, but if there is no direct observation, you can make inferences based on prior experience only. So that that is an observed somewhere that there are light bulbs. I work for it. Thank you. Um, gentlemen with glasses and all that. Yes. I have a question for uh, Truman. So, uh, I'll use an example before I ask my question. So, um, we happened for a while to work for the same uh, company that makes, makes complicated computer chips. And we both know how computer chips are designed. There are decades of experience. Um, every new design is reuses probably 80 or 90 percent of the older designs. And one analog to the I'm not a biologist, so I'm going to need some help with terminology, but the, the example where different uh, sequences of uh, nucleotides encode the same enzyme for the same, uh, I need help there, but you know, the, the, the different encodings that result in the same uh, function. Um, you draw a conclusion from the presence of the, of the exact same sequence, whereas different sequences could be present to realize the same function, you draw a conclusion that there is uh, not only common ancestry, but also random mutation and natural selection are certainly behind the picture that you see. Now, looking at, if you didn't know anything about computer chip design, which of course you do, you looked at a modern generation chip, and you see out of, let's take a simple function such as adding two numbers. There are 20, maybe 50, maybe 100 different architectures for making a, a simple circuit, like an adder. And you see an adder in a modern chip, and you see an adder of the same architecture where one of the 99 other architectures would do, and you see the same design over and over again. You see some wires that are routed from one end of the chip that had a function going to a different part of the chip, of the chip that was justified later uh, convert it into something that doesn't make any sense, would you from that evidence alone, not knowing what is exactly behind the process of designing those chips, would you conclude that they arose as a result of uh, random mutations of natural selection? No. Um, and if not, tell me why. Well, see, this is what I mentioned in my talk about mimetic uh, evolution. This is, that's, the, that's the evolution of ideas and technology. 
that's not, it's, that's totally different than biology. Just like biology, biological evolution is totally different than cosmological evolution. But information that is encoded in DNA is very analogous to the information that is encoded, that's encoded in a computer program or in a chip design. Oh, I don't think so at all. No, two totally different things. No, there's no, there's no analogy there. Why not? Uh, we're going to have to go on to the next question. Well, a computer program, for instance, it's a sequence of uh, symbols, 26 English letters arranged in keywords and names. Yeah, is, I mean, I could and so is a microprocessor okay. described in a, in a I don't think hardware really description, description language. It sounds like we don't have enough time to answer that question properly. So we're just going to move on to the uh, other gentleman. Could the uh, doctor, uh, the, the uh, evolutionary science, or at least the scientists who study evolution call it science, you don't accept that as real science. How about other sciences? Have you found other fields of sciences which are quite skeptical about, as you are, evolution? Climate change. Um, uh, and I won't yeah, delay. Yeah, because not, here's the thing, I, um, I, I'm very yeah, skeptical yeah, yeah, yeah. of yeah. theories which involve these large extrapolations over several dec several hundreds of years. I, I'm very skeptical about anything that involves these long time-based extrapolations. Yeah, because Just in general, can, I'm very skeptical. Uh, you can't replicate replicate climate change in a lab for over a day or a week or much later for You can't, you can't trust it. Uh, yeah, my my point is, is that you ask me what else I don't believe in. I don't believe anything can be called a science if it involves extrapolations over tens of thousands or millions of years. Um, so you are you're a doctor. You are obviously studying biology surgeon. and so forth. So you, I, I, I gather that you would, in general, have a pretty positive attitude about science, which is the basis of our modern life, of our real science. technology and so forth. <laughs> I have a positive attitude about real science that results in something productive. Well, I, I just want to suggest that, that you yourself uh, describe your approach as faith-based, which means it's not science-based. How can you do a rational criticism of a science if you counter it with something that's, quote, faith-based, based on some book that was written by some guys several thousand years ago who had no concept of science at all? The same way I believe in the history of Rome. It was written thousands of years ago, I believe that. Same way I believe the history of the United States, written hundreds of years ago by people that are long since dead. We all believe in things that are written down by people long since died. And we either choose to believe it or we don't. You can't do a test to see whether or not Julius Caesar was uh, emperor at the turn of the millennia. Uh, it is 9 o'clock, so uh, we are at our time limit. Thanks for all the wonderful questions.